name is McKenna Burton, for those of you that have no idea who I am. I am an extension educator for UW, based out of Uintah County, and for some reason Chance asked me to come in today and talk to you guys about what I know on supplementing um, your beef female during the winter. I'm originally born and raised in Wyoming, spent a little time in the Midwest, out in Nebraska, and the mountain for calling, so I ran back home as quick as possible. I had plenty of coffee this morning, so I'm going to try not to run too fast or get too wordy. So if I'm getting too fast, just raise your hand in the air and tell me to slow down. Okay. So I know supplementation strategies, along with most of nutrition, can be like the headache to sit down and figure out. Um, today I'm going to try to give you a little bit of knowledge to at least help you make those decisions on your own. And I have one golden rule of supplementation. Only use it if you need it. Don't be providing protein, energy, mineral, if it's not needed. At the end of the day, you're gonna be wasting your money down the drain, and we all know cow-calf producers margins are usually a little tight anyway, so don't waste it at the queue of a wet cow. I know supposedly it's winter in Wyoming right now, even though it doesn't really feel like it. We're all hurting and praying for snow. Um, but those impacts are still there. And really the impact of winter weather on cattle can make things a little difficult. Um, things we have happening right now will actually affect the future performance and profitability of not only your cows, but their future offspring. Um, so while it might be kind of tempting, and I've had the thought cross mine when I go forward with our cows, that tell dad, let them rough it, let them earn their keep while they're out there. Um, Right now, where you're moving into your last third of gestation, or soon you'll be starting lactation, right now is the worst time to have those dams nutrient restricted. Um, when the, that is not cold out, but normally in Wyoming, when that air temp is below an animal's lower critical temp, um, they must actually use, either get more energy from their feet, or they gotta use more of their energy reserves. And those energy requirements can actually increase by 10 to 30%. So keep that in your mind, even though I think it's about 40 degrees out there this morning, supposedly there's something wet coming today, so. So we're gonna take a step back and I'm gonna be probably the 400th educator to preach about body condition scoring with you. And if you're anything like my dad, you're gonna roll your eyes and not love it, but we do have to talk about it. It's kinda, it, it's the key to making most of your decisions. Um, so body condition scoring, as you guys know, it's a visual indicator of where your animals are sitting, what's their back condition. Um, and you can body condition score your animals 40 times a year, I don't care. But there are four, three key times that you need to do it. Prior to calving, prior to breeding, and at weaning. And you're gonna use these as decision making tools. What should I supplement, do I need to supplement? Breeding decisions, and really you can kind of predict how your females are gonna perform throughout the year. But winter conditions make this difficult. You've got gut fill on a low quality forage, so those girls are, aside from being pregnant, they're round from having some low quality hay in there. They're also hopefully having a pretty good hair coat on, and so that'll mask some of the things you're looking at. And then they will have shrunk after a storm, so maybe if we do get what we're supposed to today, in the next few days they'll look a little, little gant. Um, as you all, I'm sure, have been told that body condition scoring runs on a scale of one to nine for beef cattle with about a five to six being ideal. I'll be honest, I don't care if you use the scale. I would tell you all of you every day, already evaluate the condition of your cattle when you're out there looking at them, going through just a feed or whatever. You already know if your cows are looking good in the summer or if they're gonna need a little something. So Chance might run me out of here and never invite me back, but I don't care if you use the scale. It's really just an evaluation. Do my cows need more for the future or not? So UW Extension's got this pretty good article out on um, body condition scoring, so does every other university. What I like about UW is it's got three simple steps on how to do this, and we're gonna walk through them. But one thing I want you guys to kind of remember though is just like humans, cattle respond to fat differently. Whether you're looking at a Brahmin or an Angus or an Angus Burford Cross or two sisters out in the field, they all put it on differently. So you gotta look at all three points. The first one, is to look at the ribs. Those last two ribs are showing, she's automatically less than a five, less than or equal. 
Second, look at the spine. And I know lions have some pretty rangy cattle. Um, they work all summer. So a lot, a lot of times we'll kind of see this in, older, in a younger female than um, what you normally would. But if that vertebrae is visible, she's probably less than or equal to a three. And finally, I want you to look between the hooks and the pins. Like right at that round. The more of a U-shape she's got, the better condition she's in, closer to a six. If it's more of a V-shape, start sending her down the line towards a two. You guys all already do this. You already look and see how they're looking, but here's kind of the three spots you need to look at. So I'm sure you've all seen these pictures, because I'll be honest, when you do look, there's about three pictures out there, and they all suck. So I apologize for the quality of these, but I wanted to quickly show you body condition to our two. Obviously, our ribs are showing. We got vertebrae. And we got a heck of a V back here on our round. Three, Miss Hereford looks a little better. She's got a little more hair. Um, but if you really get looking, her vertebrae is showing and she's got a pretty good V shape. This number four picture is terrible. Um, but you can start to see a little more condition put on most times um, as you move that way compared to a two or three. Once you get up towards the upper end of the scale, um, five, you might start to lose those ribs. Um, looks a little damp, but might just need a little water. And you start to see just overall she looks like a healthier animal. Now six and seven, you start to put on a little more weight. Six is, I can't pick anything apart on her, really. Seven, this is where we start to call our toads. Um, you'll actually see as cattle move seven, eight, nine, they will put on fat in the brisket. Um, down underneath in the udder, their necks will get almost bull like and they tend to get these fat bones that look like tennis balls you can squeeze up under a tail head. Big old toes. Nothing like this thing is female. And if any of you are willing to call for a score, I would sure appreciate it because she is a chunk. So I know I'm mean, going to end like my father. You're telling me, well, what the hell does it matter? My cows go through the year long cycle and they gain weight and they lose weight. That's good production. And that's true. And they should gain weight. But depending on where your stores are sitting at different times of the year and their peak performances can really impact um, their future performance. So Wyoming rangelands don't tend to test that great um, on the quality scale, especially in the winter months. We're looking at low quality forages that those females are out on. And that can really inhibit their performance. What I want to show you is your reproductive impacts. Um, so as you can see, I like pictures, but if you go low body condition score at calving um, and breeding, it can really impact the number of opens that you have after the breeding season. You can see the difference between a five and a four is about 20% different. 88% on fives, female bred, only 69% on four or less. That hurts the bottom line. The other thing is, and all the economics guys, probably Bridger in the back, would tell you too, but if you want to be economically successful, your cow's got to produce one calf every 365 days. Well, it takes 285 days just to grow a calf, so that leaves you about, or about 80 days for them to get, come into heat and get pregnant again. So this length of this postpartum interval, or how quick they go into heat after calving, you can kind of shift that. So those calves that will come into heat earlier will breed quicker. Well, if they're in a low body condition score, you're already looking at somewhere between 70 and 90 days before they're going to come into heat. Once you get to five, you're hitting about 60, and that's pretty doable for her to get bred within that 80 day window. And if your cow, cows are calving at a low body condition score, you're not going to have real thrifty calves probably. They're going to be a little weaker right at birth. So I already told you a five to six body condition is ideal. Um, by breeding and <clears throat> increasing that body condition score when they're lactating is really difficult and really expensive. You're asking that cow to put on weight when she's in her peak production um, and basically taking every ounce of extra energy, energy she's got to give in milk to that calf. Um, so this is probably the most uh, extension based thing I could give you, but it is recommended the cows be in acceptable body condition. Well, no kidding. But let's talk about why. So say they cow at a body condition score five, you want them at a five at breeding. Well, you got 60 days to breed, they don't need to gain any weight. Just 
is three maintained. It's pretty doable. Now let's say she calves at a three. She calves early in the group, so she's got eight days to breed. You gotta put about two pounds a day, average daily gain on that female. Might be expensive, but it's probably doable. Say she bred up late, calves late, so it's tail end of your group. She now has 40 days to breed back. Or to get back to breeding season. You gotta put four pounds on her. Well, if you ask any feedlot manager and they've got fat steers in the feedlot, they do stuff with over four pound gain. You're probably not gonna get this, and if so, you're gonna go broke doing it. So a good rule of thumb is seven, nine, eleven. Cows in dry cows in early gestation need about seven percent crude protein. Meet the requirements. Late gestation, it bumps up two to nine, and by early lactation, you're looking at about eleven percent. Um, also, just just for your knowledge, but unless cows move from early gestation to peak lactation, basically their lowest point of um, production to their peak production, their metabolical energy requirements increase by about 80%. So, you know where your cows are at, you know whether you got, need to supplement or not, but now you gotta know what else you're feeding them. And the only way to know what your forage is, is to have it tested. I know I multiply to 400 extension educator to tell you that, but I promise you that is the only way to know what you got. And we know in Wyoming that our forages vary drastically. You guys are in a bit of a Nice spot here, you can grow some things in Riverton that the rest of Wyoming can't, and you're not asking your cows to basically eat sagebrush. But that grass hay can vary anywhere between four and 18% crude protein, and that alfalfa, alfalfa anywhere between 10 and 25%. So if you're assuming that your alfalfa is gonna be about 17%, comes in at 10, that's not good. And as we let that grass, especially in Wyoming, where most people get one cutting, mature, it increases in fiber, decreases in digestibility, and decreases in crude protein. So the best insurance policy I can tell you to make is to have your hay tested. Set aside that higher quality hay for those young animals, those heifers, or for those animals in the peak production. Save it for late, back, or late gestation, early lactation. Use that lower quality hay for your early gestation or your weaning. So now, my quick spiel on how the heck to have your hay tested, and the first thing I'm gonna tell you is just go to your extension office and your ag agent will be more than happy to help you. They will also probably lend you a probe. Um, you need to let your hay cure for 17 to 21 days, and if you fail, you cannot, most labs will not accept a grass sample. If you just pick it up out of a windrow or rip a chunk off of a bale, most labs are not gonna take that. They want a good core sample. Um, and that's the best, most accurate representation of what you got. So you need to sample base in lots, and this is where you get to choose. Um, pick your lots based on cutting. If you're lucky enough, if you're under pivot and you get one or two cuttings, sample based on cutting. Field type, if you've got a field with sandy conditions on the clay, that's all gonna change how it ends up, your grass ends up being. Type of grass, if there's a ton of clover, or you've got a meadow or something, all of those are your decisions, and you probably already do this. You separate your hay out kind of that way. Um, and also, those lots need to be sampled pretty consistently. So you need about 15 bales sampled if your lot's 30 to 40 bales. Um, place samples in your wife's good freezer Ziploc bag. I'm sure she'll love that. And make sure you label it. I know uh, <laughs> this seems a little crazy because the lab should know what the heck in the bag if it's hay, but you gotta say meadow hay, whatever. Um, put your name on it, sorry. Your address and then um, all the good identifiers. And then most basic tests will come with moisture, crude protein, they'll break down your NDF versus ADF fibers. They'll give you an estimate on energy with the energy equations. Um, and most of them will actually give you an estimate on the macro minerals. When I tell you this is the cheapest insurance policy, I'm not kidding. Um, it's about 18 to 20 bucks per test. I know if you're putting up a ton of hay that adds up, but it is, it's an insurance policy. It's a heck of a lot cheaper than the insurance on your pickup. So once you get your test back, you can kind of break it down, your forage into three types, high, moderate, or low quality. It's high quality, it's got at least 14% crude protein, 55% energy, PDN, moderate, falls between 10 and 14, 50, 55, and your low quality, which most of the native ranges in Wyoming will be kind of down in these two, is in the 
anything below 10 or below 50. So that gives you just a good kind of estimate um, on what you've got right offhand, and you kind of sort it that way. Like I said, that's what extension's here for. Um, whether it's Chance or Hudson or anybody in your area, they will be more than happy to sit down and go through the full report with you um, and read it and help you make decisions that way. So once you know what you've got, then you've got to kind of consider what are your requirements next year. It's a cycle. Um, and that's how it should be. So as you can see here, this has got months since calving and then the key the other energy requirements. Your red line would be cows, full grown females, and blue line heifers. Both expected to be about 1,200 pounds of mature body weight. Um, so as you can see, right after calving, this two months, we're getting about peak lactation, and that's when their highest energy requirements are gonna be. As summer goes along, that line slowly goes down. Cows probably eat a little more grass, mom might be kicking them off. Um, milk production drops, therefore her requirement drops. By weaning, our requirements are at the bottom. Now, as we move in the mid and late gestation, those requirements for energy steadily go up. As most of you know, your heifer calves are still growing, so they, we won't see as big of a trend um, of ups and downs with heifers. It's pretty much going up all the way through as they grow that calf and they're growing themselves. Same thing with protein. Um, you got peak lactation, you got weaning, and that calf really starts to grow and they put some pounds on that calf or maybe even twins. Those requirements just start to go up until they hit the peak. So you need to kind of plan your forage resources around these peaks and these lows. Um, this data actually came out of Iowa State University, and I know we don't impress with anyone near Iowa, um, but it's a good representation of kind of the, how these low average and high quality forages correlate to those swings in um, different production. So the two graphs you see next are, once again, energy and protein. Um, yellow line is early lactation, red line is late gestation. That low quality forage, anything tested below 50% for TDN, you're probably never gonna meet your requirements during early peak production. Average, it might. It might meet her during late gestation, but definitely not during early lactation. And if you're feeding something high quality, um, you're probably gonna meet it. But you're also probably not gonna have a ton of high quality around just because it's expensive. It's expensive to track it for now. Same thing with crude protein. Low quality will never meet your crude protein requirements, really. Your average quality hay, probably meet late, late gestation, but not early lactation. And you're probably gonna be sitting okay if you have high quality. Looking at our uh, lack of snowfall, I'm not expecting a great hay year. Hopefully that changes and we start getting the moisture, but right now it's not looking so good. So the next thing you need to do, now that I've kind of gave you a whole background on got, where your cows are, um, you got to estimate dry matter intake. And there's two ways to do this that we're going to go over today. Um, so this, if you don't believe me on taking the insurance policy and having your hay tested, these are some good rules of thumb. Um, and basically what I want to show you here is either a dry cow or a lactating cow um, being fed our three types of, or three qualities of forage. If you're not supplementing, they're going to consume about to anywhere between one and a half to two and a half percent of their body weight. If you start supplementing some protein, you're going to increase your intake. It's the same reason that everybody will tell you on a drought year in the summer, don't feed protein. You don't have enough forage for them to consume anyway, and you just ask them to consume more. That protein allows them to get more out of the forage, so they'll, those microbes will actually be getting more out and pushing it onto the cow, but that really makes the cow actually eat more. Um, the other way to estimate dry matter intake, if you did have your hay tested and you want to know a little more accurately, is actually calculate it yourself. And I am the worst person at math. I hate these, um, but it's a pretty good estimate. Their hay analysis came back and told you you had 16% neutral detergent fiber, 12% crude protein, and 52% TDM. So it's pretty average hay. It's not bad. So anything for your average and high quality hay, you're gonna use this coefficient of 120 for your NDI. If you're feeding CRP hay, or out here you're grazing corn stalks, 
for the winter, if you're out to bed, you're having a feed straw, you're going to use a one pen. Just trust me on these, don't ask me where they come from because I don't remember from grad school, but they're important. So basically, super easy equation. For our average quality hay, we're going to take 120, and we're going to divide it by our 60% NDL. It gives us 2%. That should be about what our dry matter intake is. So then, we've got a 1,400 pound cow, good sized girl. We're going to multiply that by our 2% intake. We should eat about 28 pounds of hay a day. Take that 28 pounds, you're going to have 12% of its crude protein. Comes out to, uh, out of that 28 pounds, she should consume about 3.36 pounds of crude protein. Same thing for TDN. Take our 52%, she should eat about 14.6 pounds of TDN. Well, how does that correlate to our requirements? So I know we're past having dry cows, but I want to show you this just for your reference. Um, over here on the right, I've got our how much crude protein and TDN. Um, we should eat off that 28 pounds just for reference. But we got a 1,400 pound cow. She's dry. She's in her middle third pregnancy. She only requires about 1.6 pounds of protein. We'll meet that. She only requires about 11 pounds of TDN. We'll meet that. That average hay would cover us during um, the second trimester. Now we move to the third trimester. The requirement for protein jumps up to about 1.9. TDN 13.1 cover that probably. We move on to our um, lactation. Right after calving, we're hitting peak lactation. And here you'll, you have two options, either a lighter milker at 10 pounds a day or 20 pounds a day. Um, that hay would probably meet. You only need 2.3 pounds of protein for a 10 pound milker and 14 pounds of TDN. Or we'll probably make it. We're probably cutting a little close on the TDN, but she'll do. As we move into a heavy milker, though, protein probably makes it. She only needs 2.9 pounds. We're giving her 2.6, 3.6. However, we just lost some TDN here. She needs about 16.5 pounds of TDN. We're only giving her about 14.6. So supplementation is going to be. So my whole point with this is you got to know where you're going, what you've got, what are the requirements, and you also got to figure out here, what do I need to supplement? Why would I feed her protein here and waste my money on probably the most expensive thing you can feed a cow when that's not what she's needing? Now in Wyoming, I will say most of the time we do need protein, and you've got to meet protein before you can meet energy or those you won't have any gains, which we'll look at in a bit. So the other thing you can do with that hay you had tested, so you got, had two lots of hay tested before it came back, you have a 1,400 pound cow. I got a little optimistic here and said you're only in the second trimester, but that means her crude protein requirement is 1.6 pounds. Those two lots of hay you had tested, one comes back at 9% crude protein on a dry matter basis, one comes back 7% crude protein. 2%, that's not much. So let's do the math. So we take that 1.6 pounds of crude protein that she requires, and we divide it by our 9% crude protein in our hay. She's got to consume 17.8 pounds of that 9% hay a day in order to meet her protein requirement. Do the same math for the 7% crude protein hay, and now she's got to eat about 5 pounds more. Well, 5 pounds doesn't seem like much. If we convert that from this magical thing we call dry matter into what you're actually feeding, or the hay that goes on the ground, or as fed, just divide your 5 pounds by the dry matter of 9%, or 90%, and Physically, she's going to eat 5.6 pounds. Still not much. But let's do a little math and say you've got 100 head. You take that 5.6 pounds of as fed hay and multiply it by our 100 head. Well, you've got to supply 560 pounds more of that 7% crude protein hay to meet her requirements compared to the 9%. Well, most Wyoming producers have at least 300 head. Take the same math, multiply the 5.6 pound difference by 300 head. You have to basically bail extra day. 1,680 pounds more of that 7% crude protein hay just to meet her requirements compared to nine. But it's a drought year, we're gonna make things worse. Now we're looking at 5% crude protein hay. Do the same math, she now has to eat 32 pounds of hay on a dry matter intake. Well, you convert that over into as fed, that's 36 pounds. That's a lot of hay. Take that 36 pounds, divide it by your body weight of 1,400 pounds, and make it a nice easy percentage, and multiply it by 100. She's 
got to eat almost 2.6 pounds or 2.6 percent of her body weight just to contain enough free protein to require her. Which really probably wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't so low quality hay that your digestion is really, really poor. So while she might be able to do it, it's not likely that she's going to consume enough to meet her requirements. And at a point like this, supplementation is critical. You got to meet that protein. So we talked about don't feed protein when you need energy, and same caveat, don't feed energy when you need protein. I did tell you that um, if you don't have your protein requirement met, you're probably gonna have decreased gain. Let me tell you why. If you've got thin calves, probably a body condition score of forage raising a low quality forage. Corn's cheap, and you guys actually grow corn here, so you might wanna feed corn to increase your energy intake. Well, if you supply, supplement that corn on a forage-based diet, can actually decrease forage intake and digestibility if your protein's not met. You guys aren't feeding cattle, you're feeding the bugs. And the first thing you gotta do is you have to feed those bugs because they're what actually feeds the cattle. So your dietary protein is what actually determines how that corn will be used. So if their protein's met, that corn will be utilized. If it's not, your corn will be right down the throat of that cow. Um, so here's some research down here, they've got <coughs> some uh, late gestation cows that either corn, corn and protein or protein. As you can see, um, the cows fed corn only lost about 120 pounds. Their protein requirement wasn't met. Once they start feeding corn and protein, there's only a little bit of body weight loss. And if it feds protein only, they might even gain a little. My whole point with this is make sure you are meeting your energy or your protein requirements before you decide to supplement some corn. Um, continuing on this, my train of thought and urban learning topic, but if your cows are thin, you probably need to feed both. You need, to, they're probably lacking protein and energy. You've got to increase that body condition score so you can get them ready for calving and breeding. Um, and if they're on a low quality forage, like right now, they probably can maintain or at least, or maybe even gain a little bit by protein alone. My one consideration for you, and I know this isn't possible for all producers, depending on what your pen setups are, or your manpower, or whatever, but consider sorting off your thin, your body condition score four or lower um, cows, and your young cows as heifers. Feed them separately from the rest of the herd that's in good shape, and you should see a decrease in your overall supplement costs. Um, instead of feeding the whole herd, something they don't, that only the uh, thin cows or the heifers need, Separate them off and only feed those guys what they need. And make sure you're providing, providing adequate protein and energy. This energy can come in the form of starch from corn or wheat or barley, um, whatever you can get pretty cheap in Wyoming, um, or from some fiber sources. And I understand, I, I'm sad to say I did a little time in Nebraska and was ingrained that the corn is king. I get it's cheap and protein is super expensive. But if you just look at the dollar costs on that, you can actually have some major detrimental effects if you just aren't meeting that protein requirement first. I've also had this question before. Um, I know I've heard it, and I'm sure all of you have, but you provide energy and supplement energy during late gestation, you're um, gonna increase your birth weights and dystocia. And you've heard of producers probably feeding corn or something during late gestation and having big old monster calves or having a full every third one or something. Well, what if I told you that there's research that says that's not true? I'm not saying that your body weights here, whether you're feeding a low, medium, or high energy diet are gonna increase, or that your dissociation is gonna decrease. You're probably, you probably will have some energy, or some weight gain on those calves, but you're not gonna have any more dissociation due to that. Um, so don't be afraid to give a little just to keep those cows in good condition at calving. Um, I get it, I don't want anyone out there at 2 a.m. pulling a game calf either, having called it that for a C-section. But there is research that says that you won't have increased dystocia. So now probably what you guys all care about. I mean, you feed cows, but at the end of the day, that the dollars are what matter. Uh, you can't keep feeding cows and doing what you love if you're going broke. And supplements are expensive. Protein's expensive, minerals are expensive. Um, and 
I have always, I am a penny pincher, so I'm always the first one to say, eh, I'm not going to make a dollar off that penny, I'll spend it. So let's do a little math here. Um, the first thing you got to do is, I don't care if you bought two totes of cake, you're not pricing that tote of cake, you're pricing just what you're supplementing, just the nutrient you're supplementing. So in this instance, some grain feeds your supplementing protein. So you're going to price out what adult, what each pound of protein is costing you, not what each pound of cake is costing you. So we get two examples here, either a 20% food protein cake, 380 a ton, or a 32% food protein cake at only smoked 480 a ton. Both of these are 90% dry matter. So we take 2,000 pounds in a ton, multiply it by our 90% dry matter, multiply it by our 20% food protein, Basically, at the end of the day, if you took that cake and want to put it down to just the protein, you're going to have 360 pounds of crude protein sitting on the pile. So you take that 380 a ton, you divide it by our 360 pounds of crude protein, and you get a dollar six per pound of crude protein. That makes it not look so bad. Now we take that 32% cake, do the same math, but now we got a bigger pile. We got 576 pounds of crude protein sitting over here. We still forked out an extra hundred dollars and probably dig pretty deep on our Levi's for it. So we take that 480 divided by our 576 pounds, and this more expensive per tote supplement is now only 83 cents per pound of crude protein. So while the price of that 32% crude protein could be a bit of a sticker shock, um, and it probably sucks to pull that hundred dollar bill out of your pocket for it, at the end of the day it's a better value. You're getting more pounds of protein in it, therefore you don't have to feed as much of it. Therefore it's cheaper. You can do the same math for comparing corn versus wheat or whatever. Your different mineral options. Heck, your wife can do this to compare different brands of oatmeal. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm not saying that the more expensive one's always gonna be cheaper, um, but there's times that most producers won't buy this because it's $480 versus 380 At the end of the day, it's actually cheaper. So the other question I hear quite often is, do I have to supplement every day? I know it is a pain in the butt to get up, especially in a blizzard. You had to roll break ice and you're feeding hay all day, and the last thing you want to do is go out again and supplement. Well, this data actually came out of New Mexico State University, um, who also has pretty low quality rangelands like we do. And they looked at um, what the impacts were for supplementing protein and energy if you fed them regularly or pretty infrequently. And I'll be the first one to tell you, any, anybody you talk to um, will tell you that the more frequently you feed, the lower potential for negative impacts you'll have. Well, the more often I take my vitamins, probably the more um, decreased potential I have in a vitamin deficiency. But their data shows, down here in this big table, table four, that it's probably kind of hard to read, they're looking at feeding um, a cake, a protein cake, either one time a week or three times a week. And they did this study for two years. So they still have to do, you'll see here, they fed different amounts. Well, you got to feed basically three times as much if you're only feeding it once a week versus three times a week. Um, but in their data, they basically show no significant difference um, in whether or not that protein was fed once a week or three times a week to have a in year one, we actually see maybe a little more gains, average yearly gain, in the ones fed once a week, and a little higher consumption rate. It's basically flipped in year two. But neither one of these differences are big enough to really kind of bat an eye away. The other thing they came to is they decreased their transportation and labor costs by about 60%. It's one less time you gotta start the tractor up or burn a couple of gallons of diesel to go out there, or you gotta buy a new caker or something. It all saves money in the long run. On the flip side, if you're looking at feeding energy, um, that's not quite the case. This data out of New Mexico, they fed either uh, twice a week or seven days a week, this grain feed. Um, and they actually saw major differences, only 68% um, conception rate on the twice a week versus 94% on the seven times a week, as well as they had um, weight loss if they were only fed twice a week and almost had some weight gain if they were fed every day. 
then at the end of the day, you're still going to cost the same. You're still feeding the same amount. You're just feeding it at different times. So if you're feeding protein cake, like most of you probably are in the winter, you don't have to go out every day. You can if you want to. I'm not telling you not to. But you don't have to. But if you're feeding energy, you dang sure better be out there. So now that I've probably bored you for the last hour, I'm glad that most of your coffee hasn't kicked in. Really, here's what I want you to know. You need to know the condition of your herd. And all of you, I would say, do. If you're out there enough, you are looking, you know if the grass is going to be bad this summer, these cows aren't going to puke, look near as good as they did maybe a few years ago. you got to know where, where you're at now so you can know where you're going and what you're going to need. Please have your hay tested. I swear I don't get a kickback from Ward Labs or anybody for telling you this, because if I did, I would send a lot more stuff to them. Um, but that's the only way to know what you've got. You have to have it tested to know what you got. Meeting your requirements during peak performance is critical. If you want to let them rough it in right around weaning, early winter, especially this year, we didn't have a whole lot of snow, so yeah, make them earn their keep. I'm the first person to give that to my dad for babying his cows. But when you're asking that animal to work at peak performance and produce calves for you, you've got to be meeting their requirements. And you've got to know what nutrients your cows need. Don't waste your time and money supplementing protein when they need energy or energy when they need protein. And this is a hard one because I know we, do, we all do this every year, but don't let the cows get behind. If you can keep them at a good body condition sort calving so that you're not having to put money down on them in between there and breeding, they're going to do a lot better. And calculate your supplement costs because I think most of the time you'll be surprised. My final message I'm actually a 4-H educator, I'm an ag educator, so I definitely don't get any kickback from this. Go talk to your extension agent. Chance is brilliant, he knows his stuff. I swear we're not scary. We usually probably get a coffee pot on. Um, and we, our point is here. We are paid by your tax dollars, we are here to help all of you. So come in and ask us the tough questions and make us do your research. Um, ask Chance, he's awesome. If you want, you can reach out to me, I'm down in Uinta County. I, provided my email address here, but if this hurts you to turn me off this, you can also give me a phone call and you can berate me with your questions or comments and I'd love to take them. So with that, if you guys have any questions here, I'd love to entertain them. All right, well thank you guys for coming today. I hope uh, you guys all learned quite a bit.